I really like to sort of unveil how you, after a couple of minutes, can um, actually predict the future in a, in a very serious way. Um, so we need some tools. I brought four tools with you. And I brought a list of people that inspired me and hopefully also inspired you. And you already saw Bubba Ockels. He's just uh, one of them. Uh, but first of all, well, the problem is, of course, in school time, um, we, uh, everyone is, has been told you cannot predict the future. We need a timer, by the way. Um, and uh, the problem is um, that it actually can be done. The future is actually already here if you look to certain signals, because the future is built of what we are and what we're doing right now. Um, but the problem is how to see it, how to observe what is actually happening. And there's distortion. There's a lot of distortion by giving a, a vision, an objective vision on the future. And, well, the most problematic distortion comes from <coughs> politicians. Um, like this interview, it was in 2007 for Forbes magazine. And um, uh, they asked me what one thing you were sure would happen but didn't. 2007 already, just 10 years ago. And my answer was that climate change would be taken seriously by governments, and there's an entire story behind it. You can look it up. But actually, when, when the signals were there for climate change, on what level we were not sure about, but that didn't happen that much at all. Even Al Gore was active and people like that, but still, it didn't happen. Large corporations, just on marketing level, and doing some interesting things on uh, sustainability. So there's a problem. How can we filter uh, this political uh, engagements and objective observations? Well, let me tell you, if you look through the future, you got to be realistic and um, realize what is actually not changing. Because most things in our life and generations before us did not change. I'll come back to that later. And you have to take care of your sourcing. Where do you get your information? Well, on the internet, of course. But as you might know, at this moment, we live in this information bubble. Everyone has his own information bubble uh, based on your age, religion, uh, political ideas, and so on. And the Facebooks and the Googles and all the companies give you your perfect information bubble to make you sort of happy. But that's not well, what we want to see, because we want to have signals uh, to detect what's going to happen in the future. So you got to have a broad list of different sources, unusual sources like comic strips, cabaret, whatever, everything that's happening, commercials that give us a sort of view into the future, even scientific books or science fiction. Everything what was thought by, uh, was, was made up by people, later on, on a certain moment, became reality. Uh, like flying cars, described already in the 40s and the 50s of the last century. At uh, this moment, there's Pelvi, a Dutch flying car. It's commercialized, it's available now. But it took decades uh, to prepare it. And now it is available, and well, we will see. Police can use it, and maybe we can fly as well within a couple of years. So the problem, apparently, is the timing. Everything we can imagine is going to happen sometime. But we want to know when, because we want to invest on it, we want to make decisions for choosing a study or a profession or whatsoever. So we have to look for this timing problem. And as I said, predicting the future is easy if you know how to do it. I'm going to explain it to you, but I got a few examples. Let me introduce to you five friends. It's a sad uh, thing, but they all passed away. Um, and then I was privileged to work with all of them. And this is Alvin Toffler. I presume most of you do know this uh, man. He worked with his uh, wife, Heidi, like I do with my wife, Lieke. Um, on searching on the future, doing scientific work, um, calculating, you can calculate for the future as well. Um, and well, as he said, the future always arrives too fast and in the wrong order. There's a problem to deal with. Um, but he also wrote this uh, book called uh, The Future Shock, back in the 70s. And he described uh, the current society, in fact, that people should manage 
huge amounts of information and signs and signals and, well, the brain got to get used to it. And most of us can deal with that, but some of us cannot deal with it. That are, it's sort of overwhelming for them. So it was quite timely seen back in the 70s that we're going this way. How could he do that? Because he understood what computers were doing at that time. I remember the 70s, huge computers, like the PC wasn't invented yet. Um, the ARPANET, the predecessor of the internet, was already in place, but in the beginning just connecting four uh, computer systems with each other, so it's not what we know right now. But he could calculate and understand how fast it could grow and what this would mean with data, information, knowledge, wisdom to us as a user. And maybe this name doesn't, give you, doesn't ring you a bell to you. Thijs Czernowski is Dutch. And, um, well, as you can see, this is the, the Fabeltjes Krant, uh, puppet show, long, long ago. He, well, he was TV producer, I made this up, um, but he was a sort of multicultural and multi-talented guy. He was a jazz musician and scientist as well on IT. And, for instance, he was uh, working later on on a system called the Aqua Browser, and the idea of an Aqua browser was the so-called self-announcing information. Like there is something in a computer, like uh, I've spoken um, before uh, today, like there's a huge amount of medical information and we want to do something with it. How can we create something like this information when it becomes relevant to me as a user? It sort of says, hey, I'm here, start using me or connecting me to other sources of information. That's what we like, and that's what he created. It's an Aqua browser, and it's made for closed information systems. So that's why we don't see it yet on the internet, for instance. You have to recalculate all the information which is available, which you can do with a library, for instance. So it was very quick. And once I worked with him, and he told me in the 80s, he said, you know what? We got TV right now, uh, but in the meantime, just a couple of years ago, uh, later on, almost everything will be canned and recorded before it will be broadcasted. And there's another thing, sports, uh, sports events and news, okay, that will be broadcasted live, but there will be live streaming worldwide over the internet. And now we know he meant things like uh, Netflix and Spotify, and he said, well, that's gonna change the business models of all the broadcasters and they don't recognize it in the beginning. Well, as you can see, right now with the RTLs, SBS and other broadcasters, they start recognizing that the money of the advertisers is going to just a couple of large companies um, working on uh, live streaming. And as you have seen, that, like Netflix, for instance, they're just raising the subscription uh, pricing. Um, so it's a quite an interesting model, but completely changing the way we do use media. This is Mark, Mark Cornelissen, and um, also living in the Netherlands, um, an Arctic explorer, but also a climate scientist, architect originally, in fact, uh, very clever. And long, long, long ago, he explained to me, hey, when the ice is melting on the North Pole, the color goes from wet, uh, sorry, from white to black, and we will have a problem. Because when it becomes darker, the melting goes faster and faster, and it is sort of exponential. And unfortunately, on one of his uh, trips, the last one, of course, um, he didn't make it. So he really um, uh, died over there. And well, it was maybe symbolic, but it was quite tough, of course. But all the work that he left, uh, the, the most important thing that he did, he, he took expeditions to the North Pole and put all kind of sensors and actors uh, measuring the climate and the ice and, and stuff like that. Very bright figure and check out all these figures on the internet because there's a ton of information and nice projects from them available. This is Griet Titelaar. And Griet Titelaar was sort of Inspector Gadget. Um, who knows um, Griet Titelaar, by the way, because it's a, a generation thing, uh, if uh, noticed. Once I was working with him with, uh, at the uh, University of uh, Delft, and he, um, he explained 
that, well, uh, he, he had, of course, he, he lived in the time there was no microwave and stuff like that, and he explained how everything went so fast that he couldn't even catch it up and that he couldn't explain it to the people surrounding him because he saw all the different gadgets and new uh, consumer electronics, but most people just saw, saw just a few things and it could not connect. And because he saw so many new devices, he could easily detect whether something was completely new or something old presented as new. By the way, the image here on the background is a, a, a phone on his uh, bicycle. It was a, a Fool's Day joke. And he invited uh, the Dutch people, hey, do you want to have this bike with a phone? Uh, write me a postcard and you can join in. And a lot of people did. He had some humor as well. Well, Wobble Ockels um, was prepared as well in my talk, but fortunately we could show the entire uh, video on time and gravity. And uh, being honest, it took me five times to completely understand the video and he explained it to me and then finally I got the click and his idea was to write a book about it. I didn't come that far, but there are some people thinking about it to sort of well, recreate it and, and look what we could do with this information to bring it uh, to the world. Well, I started my talk with promising you that you could predict the future, so we got to work. I got four tools for you. And um, two rules of thumb, uh, but we start with uh, the future funnel. Because what I noticed, I started back in 89, I noticed some, to predict something in the far future is way more easy than predicting something for next year or within two years. Like predicting uh, the engraving society will peak around something like um, 2035, 37, by about. But in fact, because I'm taking this long-term prediction, it doesn't matter exactly when it will be, as long as I know, oh, it's something about that. Because there might something happen. Migration, emigration, whatever. Uh, maybe a volcano might burst out. Eh? In, in Germany, there's a volcano at Trier uh, that could, uh, it's calculated, could uh, uh, be active uh, in the decades to come. We'll see. Hopefully not, of course. So first start predicting far away and then bring it back to the years to come. It's often used, like you're sketching the, the trends and then bring it back to strategy for an organization or your personal ideas. That's number one. There's the uh, first law. Um, what I call, and well, um, be aware whether you, you can um, agree on it, I think nothing is changing on conceptual level for ages. Like the old Chinese and the Greek and everyone had a chair. And now you're sitting on a chair as well. But the chair is different. It looks different. The appearance of the chair is different. Because we thought, hey, this chair would be handy uh, to make it like this. But something completely different, being in love in the past, on conceptual level, was about the same as at this moment. But as we can show it, the appearance of being in love, for instance, or being religious or whatever, that's completely different all the time. So what do we have to do to predict the future? Understand what kind of conceptual thing we're describing or looking for, like mobility, and then say, hey, um, what will be the next appearance of something like mobility? Or as you can see here, a store, shopping, an ancient store, and on the other side, a um, more modern store from a couple of years ago. It's in a subway station in South Korea, uh, where it's just a poster, and you can use your QR codes to do some shopping. In the meantime, we already have the next appearance, uh, which is on our phone, of course, and the very next is buy on the fly, that you just point your phone to an object, and you say, hey, that lamp, I like that, give me some, um, shops where I can get it, and both pricing and stuff like that. So, if you want to predict something, look for the next appearance of a certain concept. We're almost there. I say, if you think in structures and interests, and I mean interest by what people want to do or have to do because of their uh, profession, or someone is um, 
prime minister or working for the union or mayor or your boss or your wife or whatever, you can predict what someone would say if you would ask them. So you don't have to ask them because you already know what they would say. Now, uh, if you want to predict this future, you're not asking one person in your mind, but you get this overview of the entire playing field. That's why all the puppets are down there. And if you know this field of forces, you can sort of feel in which way something will develop. Well, like traffic jams in the Netherlands, where there's an economic upturn at this moment. Well, of course, there's more traffic jam, so it will be a serious problem. Politics will say something about it, and there will be taken measures. What kind of measures? Well, yeah, we can make broader roads or whatsoever, or we can start flying or whatever. And then you start searching on conceptual level for mobility, like, hey, what will be the next appearance of mobility, for instance? The last one. It's the so-called to-do method. You can look it up on the web. And um, it is based on this matrix. Like a trend is just a change that takes a long time. So you can invest on it and you can take decisions and you combine this with the other three tools. So you can see for inspiration, look to the outside world, outside of your company, outside of your school, outside of your family life, whatever. Um, what is changing? Has been changing a couple of years ago, changing at this moment, in the near future, what can you expect? And then, next to these changes, these trends, you describe your opportunities. It's like a SWOT analysis, eh? like a strong, weak, and then stuff like that. Describing your organization, for instance. And then you can compare the trends, eh, the changes, with the opportunities. What are you able to do? what might be done. And that's where the deliverables come in, which are actually innovations, process innovations, most important of all, and product innovations and service innovations. Most uh, made mistake is that people say, hey, I observe a trend for this future and translate it directly into some kind of innovation. That's not how the world works. And there's a lot of trends and they got to co be cooperated and together with the opportunities, what are you able to do? What is your study background, for instance, or what is the knowledge within your organization? Therefore, you can create innovations on process level, product level, and um, service level. The last one is not that important. Like objectives, it's more like prioritizing. What's for short term and what is for the longer term? So I challenge you. Start designing your future by first observing it. Use the tools. You can find a lot of documentation on it, and it has been used already by many organizations. Um, it's a uh, sort of thin method because it's not the method what works. It's the people who use the method who make it work. So I challenge you, and I will challenge you actually in a few minutes. So start it up up there. Um, and the last thought for me for closing down, uh, I think next to history class um, on uh, primary and secondary school, we should start with something like a uh, future class. Thank you so much and I uh, hope to see you in the future. Thank you.